and welcome back to the show. You, while you've not been on the podcast before, we've had you here before um, during COVID, and we got to talk about a lot of different things then. And we are so happy that you agreed to come back to Dio Point and join us for a couple of podcast episodes this season. Thank you so much. Sam, it's my pleasure. How's Aaron doing? He's good. He's good. He started high school this week. And he, he's actually right now, as we record this, doing geometry homework. He was sitting here beside me because he wanted to be beside me to do it. And geometry was not my forte. I, I remember a lot of algebra, but not a lot of geometry. So I was of no use anyway. And then I told him, I said, I'm so sorry, you have to leave because I'm going to speak with Gary. And he's like, can I just sit right here and just do my homework while you're talking to him? <laughs> I said, it's really hard to interview someone while there's geometry homework going on at the same time. So he's, he's Maybe good. he can apply those skills to design more ergonomic diabetes stuff. He probably could actually, hopefully. Let's see. He's thinking architecture, but maybe, maybe some kind of clinical bio medical design could be in his future <laughs> oh i suppose the world needs architects also so that's okay they do they do all are needed all are needed all are good anyway so today we are going to talk about things that affect blood sugar and this is an, a, a, an important discussion for uh, people with diabetes whether it's type 1 or type 2 because I think, you know, we all realize that food can affect blood sugar, but it's not just about the food. It's about so much more than that. And who better to ask this question than you? Because also I see you and your staff sharing graphs and different things and when you eat different things, but when you also do different things and what's happening to your blood sugar and what's going on and how no two are alike, it's also interesting to compare and contrast that as well. Um, so we'd like to really learn more about that for sure. You know, one of my favorite teaching tools here in my, in my office is a, a scale. It's a balancing scale. And we have a variety of things we throw on each side to represent you know, factors that raise and lower glucose levels. There's, there is so much stuff. You know, the, the key ones, the major ones are the food, as you mentioned, the carbohydrates specifically, uh, and insulin and physical activity and also the stress hormones. And I, I have a, a picture of my mother-in-law to represent the, the stress hormones. That's, I just needed something to put there and it seemed appropriate. Uh, but, you know, even within those categories, there are so many factors and variables that, that come into play. You know, and that's why diabetes is so challenging to manage. We, we can't even come close to matching what a healthy pancreas and beta cell can do to, to regulate glucose levels. You know, I have patients who come to me and say they want to keep their blood sugars between 70 and 120. And I just have to laugh. And I say, oh, I'm sorry, are you a beta cell? We don't have that ability. You know, we, can do, we can come close, but you know, there's just too many variables to try to manage all at one time. And is it not true, and I've seen people show some graphs before, but is it true that also People without diabetes, we can go above 120 as well, or yeah, below 70 from time to time. Yeah, even somebody without diabetes, it's it's actually normal to have glucose levels in the 60s uh, when you don't have diabetes. And it's normal after meals once in a while for glucoses to peak up as high as 140, especially with a high glycemic index, high carb type of a meal. You know, blood sugars can peak up into the low to mid hundreds it usually settles back down again very quickly to a normal level. But yeah, even those without diabetes see some bumps and peaks and valleys in their glucose levels. I've had that happen once. And because we have a few glucose meters around the house, I've checked when I felt off. Once I was doing sports, I didn't eat well that day and I was feeling shaky and I was high 60, low 70. Mm -hmm. And I was in the room and Aaron was there my husband as well. And I'm like, guys, I have low blood sugar. And they just kept talking about what they were doing. So he was like, hey, <laughs> me, low blood sugar, no problem. Mm -hmm. And then one night I was sitting around by myself and I had had after dinner, some dragon fruit and a fruit, some fruit yogurt. And I think I threw a scoop of ice cream in there. And something about that after I again felt off and I tested and I was on the higher side. And I, and of course I thought, you know, could I be insulin resistant or pre type two? 
I had a checkup coming the next week. They, everything was fine, but it does happen. And I think probably often, and we don't even realize it because the average person is not, not checking their blood sugar. Right. So when beta cells are functioning, right. They're, they're a well-oiled machine. They really do the job. Well, the moment glucose levels start to rise, those beta cells secrete their stored up insulin into blood vessels that nourish the liver immediately and then circulate to the rest of the body. So you have that insulin working within seconds, you know, as opposed to the insulin that we take when we have diabetes and that stuff doesn't start doing anything for 15 minutes and takes hours to do its job. There's this tremendous lag time involved. Uh, and then when glucose levels even start to decline slightly, the pancreas stops secreting insulin and the insulin that's still in the bloodstream clears within a few minutes and glucagon is produced. So by the neighboring alpha cells. So you have a, a very tightly managed system when the pancreas is functioning properly. A slight rise, you get immediate insulin action. A slight drop, you get a, a halt to insulin action and glucagon being produced. You know, it's like a, a thermostat in a house where the heat and the air conditioning are constantly balanced, keeping the temperature within a comfortable zone. I know where you are, there's not a lot of heat involved, but you know, picture uh, you know, where the temperature does actually get cold. You have this tightly regulated process. And we just don't have that when we have type one diabetes. We have you know, zero beta cell function. We have glucagon production that's blunted by the presence of, of insulin. So that's why you know, things can be more challenging. And as we mentioned before, these countless variables that affect glucose that we don't even think about and, and account for. Are there some things, like when you mentioned stress, is there any evidence or research that talks about different types of stress might, while we know no two people are alike, but different types of stress that might cause higher blood sugar than others? Or yeah, and, and there, are, there are even kinds of stress that can cause glucose to drop. What the, the, ver the factor we have to consider is the hormones that are produced. If somebody is under a state of chronic stress, just you know, dealing with a lot of stuff and having a hard time managing it, we see a, a, a rise in, in cortisol levels throughout the body. Cortisol is a type of a stress hormone that creates insulin resistance. It actually opposes insulin's actions. So glucose levels tend to run higher than usual almost all the time when cortisol levels are high. And that's a little different from an acute bout of stress. You know, like if you're driving your car and the car in front of you slams on the brakes and your heart starts to race, you're producing adrenaline in a case like that. And the adrenal hormones, you know, epinephrine, norepinephrine, those cause the liver to dump glucose into the bloodstream very quickly. So blood sugars rise very sharp, very quickly. And you know, that can be challenging as well. Then there, there are also stresses that don't induce a lot of hormone production, sort of like when you're, you're busy and you're multitasking and, and you're just trying to do a thousand things at once. That kind of stress will often make glucose levels drop. As most people don't realize that besides the muscles, the part of the body that burns the most glucose is the brain. And when the brain is working overtime, when it's multitasking and doing a lot of things, you're burning glucose at an accelerated rate. I, I know instances where I've been networking. I've been at social events and dealing with a lot of people, trying to remember names and this and that, and so, interacting with lots of folks. My blood sugars drop in those situations. Supermarkets do it to me also. There's so much visual stimulation and you're comparing prices and calculating things. And my blood sugars drop when I shop. So you know th that that type of you know, call it stress, but just mental work, mental burden also can make blood sugars go down. So stress can work both ways. It can lower glucose, but if, if it induces hormone production, yeah, it can raise blood sugar and it can raise it a lot. You know, the, the, the adrenal hormones can raise the blood sugar very fast and, and quite a bit. You can shoot up you know, hundreds of points in a short period of time I forgot, do you guys measure in milligrams or millimoles there? No, well, it depends, honestly, because in the UAE, about 80% of the population is expat. 
So depending on where they're from, some doctors will, you know, speak more UK-ish and others will follow. It, it just depends. But we're, you know, it. so both. There are people listening that would understand both. Okay. So when I say hundreds of points, it might mean uh, tens of points in, mm -hmm. in millimole terms. Somebody could easily rise from a, a six to a 25 in a short period of time where they could rise from a 110 to a 300 in a very short period of time when they're under significant acute stress you know, that causes the, the adrenal hormones to kick in. Mm, that is fascinating. And I never thought about that, about brain activity, but it seems very logical when they tell us all the time, don't put your kid on a low carb diet because the brain needs sugar and or, or carbs. It uses it to, to think and for cognitive function. So that makes perfectly good sense. And now it's something that I really want to watch and see what happens. That actually, it, it brings up an, another important consideration. Now, your, your body will produce, it'll make its own glucose, but it'll make it from other energy sources. So people who are on low carb diets, it's not as if they won't have sugar in their bloodstream, but their liver will make that sugar. It'll manufacture it mainly from protein. So a lot of the protein people eat who are on low carb diets, it ends up raising their glucose level anyway. Mm. So they're not necessarily saving themselves from you know, rising blood sugars. They're just using protein to create that instead of carbohydrates. So just within that grand heading of food raising blood sugar, again, it's not just carbs that can induce a rise in blood sugar levels. Protein can do it if people aren't eating enough carbs. And even dietary fat can affect glucose levels. Fat doesn't convert directly into glucose, but when there's a lot of fat in a meal, it tends to cause the body to become insulin resistant. We see this in people with type two diabetes where their triglyceride levels are very high and that induces a state of insulin resistance in the body. So insulin doesn't work as well. I used to see this anytime I'd eat like pizza or go out for dinner and have a high fat meal, my blood sugars would rise all night long. And that's because of the, the fat content of the meal causing this insulin resistance. Uh, so that's another thing to watch for is the high fat meals and the effects that can have. And we don't really consider it part of our diets, but alcohol is another thing that can affect glucose levels, but it does it in a reverse way. Alcohol contributes to a decline in blood sugar levels, mainly because it inhibits the liver's normal output of glucose. We take basal insulin to offset how much sugar the liver produces. And if the liver is making less glucose than usual, and we still have that basal insulin present, the blood sugar can drop. So that's something we have to be careful about mm. too. Super important. So I have a lot of questions about the food, but before I come back to that, other things that might make your blood sugar rise or drop. I remember a diatribe, I think it was, they put out this article a few years back that's very popular. There's like 50 things on the list. So it's it's like, it's it seems like, everything and anything. And then sometimes I don't have a logical explanation. I remember when my son was younger and it, Aaron would be having really high blood sugar for no reason. And my husband would ask like, what happened? And I was like, the moon, cosmic things happening that I couldn't explain. And I'm always one, I'm curious, I'm trying to figure out what it is to avoid it from happening again. But there were like the 1% of the outliers that I really had no logical explanation for. Yeah, we can probably categorize all of those 50 or 100 or whatever they are uh, under a few main categories. Uh, they, they either fall under the category of, of things we eat, uh, energy being burned, or hormone levels. Those ultimately are going to account for it. You know, for example, illnesses can affect glucose levels, uh, but it does it by changing our activity patterns. It changes our food intake. It also affects hormones. So somebody who has an infection, let's say they have uh, the flu, they have upper respiratory infection, infection creates insulin resistance by causing the production of hormones that lead to insulin resistance. So illnesses, most illnesses will cause blood sugars to rise significantly. But some illnesses, especially those that keep us from absorbing the food we've eaten, 
I don't know if Aaron's ever had a stomach flu or been yes. vomiting, but blood sugars can really drop a lot under those circumstances because food we ate didn't absorb or it didn't yeah. absorb as much as we expected it to. So hypoglycemia can result under those kind of conditions. And does that happen in people, sorry to interrupt you, does that happen in people with type 2 as well? If they're having like a stomach virus and things like this, then will they experience some mild hypoglycemia or something similar? Well, it it depends. If someone with type 2 diabetes, they can only have hypoglycemia if they're taking insulin or they're taking medications that cause their pancreas to secrete a lot of insulin. If they're not taking any of those meds, they're, they're not going to become hypoglycemic. Okay. But, you know, if you have someone with type 2 who's on an intensive insulin program, and all the same rules apply as they would with somebody with type 1, the mm-hmm. highs and the lows can happen the same way. Okay. The medications we use when we're sick can have effects too, even medications that don't involve illnesses. Steroid medications that are taken for inflammation People often receive steroid meds if they have an inflammatory type of a disease, uh, if they have a, a inflamed knee, shoulder problems, things like that. They might get injections of steroid medications. Steroid medications directly oppose insulin's actions. So when we mm. take these, glucose levels tend to rise very, very high, and they'll stay that way for several days. I've had situations myself where I've had frozen shoulder issues where I get a cortisone shot. I have to double or triple my insulin doses for almost a week after getting one of those. Oh, wow. It it has significant effects. And there's there's a lot of medications that can have subtle effects on glucose levels. Usually, uh, you you can read up online and get lists of what those are, but the steroid medications are the ones that probably Mm. have the greatest impact. What about vitamins? People are always really curious. What is the best vitamin to take or, and and in the context of diabetes, will it affect their blood sugar? Are there any particular, not a brand of vitamin, because we know sometimes they can have additives or sugar in them, but you know, a vitamin C versus vitamin D or anything out there that's, that's affecting blood sugar as well. Uh, Not directly. Uh, There's no vitamins that are going to improve someone's glucose control unless they're deficient. If, if their diet is severely deficient in certain vitamins or minerals, in most people, it's a good idea to take a multivitamin. One vitamin that's become popular in recent years is vitamin D. Mm-hmm. And normally when you're outdoors, the sunlight, your, your skin will actually create vitamin D from direct sun exposure. Uh, there's no shortage of that where you guys are. But well, you would the... be surprised. We have <laughs> a lot of people that do not have enough vitamin D. And mm. I am not really on a lower side of that because I'm out and I'm horrible about sunscreen. Mm. I, I might use a little. Um, but a lot of people are not absorbing it, even people that are outside or sometimes because also we have a lot of more conservative dress here as well in the Muslim community. And some women are not exposed to sunlight that much at all. So there is a lot of vitamin D deficiency here in the region. It's, it's, it's a challenge for a lot of people. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, here in the States also, you know, a lot of people are avoiding direct sun exposure because of skin cancer risk, et cetera. People in Northern latitudes are often lacking in you know, sufficient vitamin D levels. And the reason it's become more in vogue now is the link that's been established between vitamin D levels and healthy immune system function. Mm -hmm. As we all know, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune condition, but other immune issues involving like COVID, et cetera, uh, people want healthy immune systems now. It's more important than ever. So measuring vitamin D levels in the bloodstream annually and making sure that it's sufficient. So a lot more people now are taking vitamin D supplements, but like with anything, there's too much of a good thing is not a good thing. So you have to you know, talk to your doctor about what's an appropriate amount to take. Exactly. Yeah. People always ask, what is the best amount? I said, it's a, definitely a question you want to ask your doctor. And we do try to take a vitamin D supplement every day. I give one to Aaron because him being type one, and but also for myself, because we're indoors working when it's 50 degrees and 100% humidity mm-hmm. outside. 
I'm not really going to go stand in the sun for, yeah. for long enough to absorb anything. I don't even know if you can absorb vitamin D well when it's so hot and hazy and everything else, but yeah, that might be fascinating. So when it comes to exercise also, because I know a lot of people, there's many questions within that topic. And one thing that, um, you know, we have been talking about is one people that don't have mm -hmm. diabetes that are wearing continuous glucose monitors now because they're being marketed as like a sport device. So that's one kind of one part of the question, or it's one part of maybe the listener population who I would like them to be aware to understand what exercise and different types of exercise do to your blood sugar. Because some people will expect uh, parents with children with type one diabetes that their child exercise and that would automatically assume that it's going to drive their blood sugar down, but it doesn't. So can you talk about the different types of exercise and what that does to our blood sugars? Sure. And, and it reminds me of when I was diagnosed back in the 1980s and the nurse I saw try to explain to me about how insulin works. And there's this analogy of picturing a, you know, a cell with doors on it and those doors have locks. And the only way to open those doors is with insulin. So insulin acts like a key that opens the doors to the body's cells and then glucose can get inside. And that's how blood sugar levels go down and cells are nourished. Physical activity has a direct impact on those doors. Uh, one thing it does is it proliferates doors. You act, your cells actually produce more doors when you're physically active. And those extra doors can hang around for a while, even after the workout is over. And in, in having more doors, it makes it, it gives insulin a chance to lower the blood sugar a lot easier. It's sort of like if you're at a, on a highway on a toll road and they open up all the toll booths, the traffic can flow through much easier than if only one toll booth is open. Then you have this long line of traffic behind it. So having all these, these extra doors, and technically those doors we refer to as insulin receptors. So having more of these insulin receptors on the cells just allows insulin to do its job much more effectively. In people who are physically active, their body cells have lots and lots of these doors, lots of these insulin receptors. So the insulin, however much is taken, can work effectively. When people are inactive, they have fewer doors. Sort of like if that toll road doesn't have much traffic, they're not going to keep paying the toll booth collectors. They're going to shut half of them down. So your cells actually shut down these doors if there's not much of a need, if they're not doing much work. Uh, and you have fewer, recept fewer receptors for the insulin on the cells, and the insulin can't work as effectively. And this can vary from hour to hour and day to day. It's another one of those big variables that's thrown into the mix. Now, in some cases, if you exercise in the morning, you're going to be more sensitive to your insulin in the morning. And if you're not moving at all, all afternoon and evening, you're going to be less sensitive then. If you have a day where you do a very hard workout, you could be more sensitive to your insulin for the next 8, 12, 24 hours afterwards. And then if the next day you do absolutely nothing, it drops again. So this constant ebb and flow to how well the insulin works. Think of it like an activity is like a, an amplifier for insulin. You know, you're turning it up, you're turning it down, depending on how physically active you are. And it, it depends on you know, the nature of the activity, how intense it is, how long you do it for. The more intense the activity, the longer you do it, the more you're turning that amplifier up, the better your insulin is going to work. And the longer that's going to continue for you. There's uh, something called a delayed effect we often see with fairly intense exercise. And we see this with kids a lot. If they have a practice for a sport in the afternoon, their blood sugars may drop into the evening. And that happens because you know, they're still sensitive to insulin for that period of time. And they're also replacing something called the glycogen stores, the sugar stores that were held in their muscles that were burned up during the activity. So in general, you know, physical activity is going to make insulin work better and contribute to a decline in blood sugars. But as you pointed out, 
it doesn't always happen. Have you ever seen Aaron's glucose go up from certain kinds of activity? Oh, yes. Basketball, yeah. mm -hmm. probably a combination of the type of sport plus adrenaline. And yes. much to my surprise, tennis also. He he does really well if he has a little bit of insulin before playing tennis. I don't know if everyone mm -hmm. playing tennis, that's the case. But with him, I had to start doing that because he he would come out of tennis practice high almost every time. Yeah. So you said a very important word just a moment ago, adrenaline. Mm. Adrenaline falls in that hormone category of things we were discussing before. And with some forms of physical activity, the body doesn't produce much in the way of adrenaline or other stress hormones. Uh, if you spend a half an hour just walking on a treadmill, you're not going to make a lot of adrenaline. You know, if you're out working in the garden, you're probably not going to make a lot of adrenaline unless you know, you're chased, getting chased by a bee or something. Mm -hmm. But with other forms of sports, there can be a lot of adrenaline production, particularly competitive sports, um, sports where you're being kind of scored or graded or evaluated on what you're doing, sports that involve just fast bursts of movement, all out sprints swinging a baseball bat and running to first base. There's a, there's a fair amount of adrenaline because you're, you're working at a, your maximum potential for just a short period of time. Weightlifting, particularly very heavy weightlifting, low rep, high weight types of lifts. There's a, quite a bit of adrenaline produced when you do those activities. So if the physical activity is contributing to a drop in the glucose and the adrenaline is contributing to a rise, you just have to see where it balances out. Sometimes the lowering effect is greater than the rising effect and the blood sugar will come down some. Other times the rising effect exceeds the falling effect and the blood sugar winds up going up. So that's again, another variable is how much adrenaline a person produces during that activity. Interestingly, the time of day the activity is performed can also make a big difference. It's quite a bit of research now that shows how early morning physical activity has a different effect on glucose levels than the mm. same exact activity performed later in the day. Mm. So if you were to go out for a jog for half an hour, first thing in the morning, the glucose level might not drop at all. It might even rise a little bit. The same jog performed in the afternoon or evening would likely make the glucose drop significantly. So that's another variable. And of course, a lot of these are can vary from person to person. But for the vast majority of people, the earlier the activity is performed, the less of a decline we're likely to see. And there's even a chance the blood sugar will rise a little mm, bit. Why is that? Well, it's related to what we call a dawn phenomenon, where mm. the body's already producing hormones that raise the blood sugar. And when you combine that with a little bit of adrenaline and those hormones are just produced in larger amounts and they're circulated better, you, know, you start to see a little bit of a rise in the blood sugar with that morning activity. So does that mean that, I guess it was 90s or so, there was the graph going around how exercise in the morning was so great for your metabolism and I don't know what the X and I, Y axis were exactly, but they would always show you this graph where a morning walk or a morning run is, you know, was allegedly better for you. But now this is, doesn't necessarily sound to be the case. Or is it well, all exercises beneficial? It's not that we should all switch our programs. I, I still believe all exercise is beneficial. And from a caloric standpoint and a conditioning standpoint, there's no difference whether you work out in the morning or the evening. Um, there is a difference in how the blood, the blood sugar response takes place. There's also a difference in a person's ability to stick to their program. People who work out in the morning are much more likely to stick with it long term. People who work out later in the day, there's too many things that can get in the way and too many oh, yes. distractions and other responsibilities that can come up. That's true for me anyway. I, and I'm, I was never such like a, a morning person. I didn't enjoy working out in the morning. I quite enjoyed working out in the afternoon or evening, mm -hmm. but as I get older and have a child and responsibilities and I need to feed him and do all these things, then 
it's best I just do it in the morning. Otherwise, it it's mm -hmm. more difficult to find the time or do it for as long as I would prefer to in the evening. I have to cut it short, which you. is not good. But yeah, I have I'm, a. I'm not really a morning person. I don't, I don't yeah. know how you feel, but yeah, I'm not much no. of a morning person. I used to get so annoyed when around the type time that Aaron was diagnosed, there was all this promotion for the 5 a.m. club and this and that. And I'm like, who are these people? They don't have children with diabetes <laughs> because I'm not sleeping. I am not part of the 5 a.m. club. And even before that, I never really was. So, yeah. yeah. I think uh, my, my metabolism, I think I peak around eight o'clock at night. That's when I get my best workout. Okay. Too. So, so yeah, all of you listening, work out whatever time works best for you. And this is great permission that if someone's forcing you to do it early morning and you don't want to, you do yeah. it on your time. Yeah. And I've been using the phrase physical activity uh, rather than exercise. I, I think of exercise as just physical activity that you force yourself to do that doesn't have any particular purpose other than to stay in good shape. Physical activity, though, includes almost any movement that we undertake. So it, it, things like cleaning the house, working in the yard, going to the mall and walking around, you know, it, working on your car, any kind of labor intensive hobbies that a person might have, you know, chasing kids around. Mm. Any forms of physical activity are going to induce this effect, the mm. same as as exercise would. You know, doing things like you know casual yard work is equivalent probably to walking three miles an hour on a treadmill in terms of the energy you're burning up. Oh yeah. Especially a if lot it's of 40 people... degrees outside. Oh yeah. <laughs> There's another variable for you is temperature. Yeah. You know, the... Yeah. The, the warmer the temperature is, the harder the body works to keep it cool because you have to you know, sweat off the uh, in order to cool yourself. You burn more energy and your glucose is likely to drop uh, in, under warm, humid conditions than it is under cooler and drier conditions. So there's just one more variable to have to worry about. And then insulin absorption varies based on skin temperature too. So if somebody who's taken a, a, an injection or a bolus with their pump, their insulin is going to absorb faster, peak earlier and clear earlier when their skin temperature is warm. Mm. So just another variable to throw into the mix. It's, it's fascinating because the variables, and if you mix all of those together, there almost feels like there's an infinity number of possibilities. Yeah. To, yeah, and yeah. This is why, you know, I, I first thing I do with most of my new clients is establish realistic goals. A lot of them don't have realistic goals going in, you know. And for most people, if you can keep your glucose between seventy and one hundred and eighty, or like four and ten, you can stay in that range seventy percent of the time. You're doing a terrific job. You know, yeah. pancreas would look at that and laugh. It's like I can do that in my sleep, but considering all the variables we have to contend with when we live with diabetes, that's a major accomplishment. You know, 70% of time in that zone is not easy to achieve. Yeah. Uh, you know, some of the newer technologies, it helps, but it's still a, a real challenge. Yeah. I think, I think it really, it really is. And I was so happy when we finally found a, a doctor here that could explain that because I was reading it like in your book, for example, and some doctors that he would see not for his diabetes but for other things would often you know at a very young age they didn't realize it but the way that they were not shaming him but it could create a certain amount of shame if you're not getting perfection and it's impossible to get perfection and staying within us like of course we know time and range is more important now but just having a doctor that realizes that and now Aaron's older and can talk to him about it and you know see the um you know what he's doing and you know doing a great job and different things like that so it's it's so mm -hmm. important to to recognize that range and I think also for any moms listening that have children because I do also see a lot of moms um in our our group and things that they'll strive for perfection and it's so hard in a child and a small child. And one of the things that I was told very early on, even though Aaron's male, not female, but diabolemia eating disorders, and it, it's, it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot to deal yeah. with. Yeah. There's such a thing as, as 
too tight when it comes to glucose levels. You have to balance you know, the benefit of, of glucose control against the work and the risks that come along with it. So there's not much evidence that A1Cs below six and a half do any good at all, uh, unless you're pregnant. Hopefully most of your kids are not, but you nope. get that A1C down to about six and a half, your long-term complication risk is not going to improve by getting it tighter. But, you know, your risk of hypoglycemia can go up exponentially. Mm -hmm. And the amount of work and energy and effort you have to put in and cost can go up quite a bit. So it, it's about striking a, a healthy balance mm -hmm. of managing well enough to live healthy today, prevent long-term problems, but not have it interfere with your day-to-day -day quality of life. Yep, exactly. And so we've talked a lot about, you know, exercise and the different things that affect people. And as I'm asking all the experts in this season that have joined us, the discussion about CGMs, continuous glucose monitors used by people without diabetes, it's become very trendy here. Um, there was a well, very well-known or the most well-known radio DJ um, who had a TikTok video or something. He started wearing a device and I guess he's kind of an influencer. We didn't, he's a personality that's, you know, got a lot of followers. And so he started using this device and someone shared a video of him checking his blood sugar and said, Hey, that's great. It'll really normalize it for our kids. I said, but, or will it? Because now we wonder if one people understand what that data really means, if they know how to use it, if it's helpful. So based on all these things that we've just been discussing that affect our blood sugars and people with diabetes and their blood sugars. I would love to understand from you what what you see or what the research says. If there's any research about this yet, um, or your take on it. As far as I'm aware, there isn't any research and nothing showing any benefits of using these systems if you don't have diabetes. Uh, I mean, in my mind, the only potential benefit and this would have to do with food choices, is that some people might see a temporary spike in their glucose after consuming things that are you know, very high in carb or very fast to digest, you know, these high glycemic index mm. types of foods. Although some of these are still can be part of a healthy diet, like juice, for example. You, know, you, you shouldn't tell somebody without diabetes you shouldn't drink juice. But yeah, juice might make their blood sugar rise temporarily. But what's the problem with that? I mean, there really isn't one. If your glucose rises to 145 or 150 for a few minutes and then comes back down, there's no harm done. So I, I don't really know that <laughs> using a CGM or even doing finger stick testing is going to be of benefit to people without diabetes. Uh, as far as, as normalizing it for kids with diabetes, you know, I, I'm not sure it, it's really going to do that either because they're these other people are using it for completely different reasons. They're using it, I guess, more for you know personal and vanity type reasons than anything else than to manage a disease. And I'm mean, any you ask any kid, if you had the choice, would you do finger sticks and wear a CGM or would you rather not? Of course they're gonna say not. not. Who wants to do that sort nobody of thing? does. It's hard. No, nobody does. We do it because we have to. We we have to do that to keep ourselves healthy and take care of this. But I think people who are doing it voluntarily, that that to me doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. I think people don't know how to use the the data. Um there's a podcast that I listen to and I having a podcast, but I, I love listening to, to good podcasts. There's a few that I really enjoy. And um, there's one called The Proof with a guy named uh, Simon Hill. He's based in Australia. He's got a PhD in nutrition. Mm -hmm. If I'm listening in the car, it's really hard because it's one of those where I need to pull over and take notes to under, you know, to remember because it is so scientific in the best way. It's amazing. Like I, it, they're up to date on the research. They talk about, you know, misleading things that people might see that, you know, why it's untrue and they, you know, break it down in a very nice way. But often he'll have one of his friends or colleagues on um, who his first name is Drew and I'm forgetting his last name right now, but he's also from Australia and he has type one diabetes. And I believe he studied exercise physiology. 
So one day they started talking about this and they also said they didn't see, you know, what the benefit was. And then the people that were using it don't know what they're looking at really. And almost everyone that I'm speaking with feels very similarly in, in the diabetes world. Um, and what I really, you know, wish is that if people are going to use it, that they do really understand the science behind it and how they're not going to have a perfect flat line. And I don't think the average person, none of us, we're, we're not going to the Olympics that we need to be tracking our mm -hmm. blood sugar that carefully. Maybe if you're going to the Olympics, that's a different story. Even, so, even people go into the Olympics. Even people go into the Olympics. Okay, thank you. I'm not the expert to say that, but I'm glad you did. So it, um, it's, it's expensive and it's, it's not, you know, necessarily gonna help you. Maybe way, I, I feel like it cheapens the work and sacrifice that all of us with in the diabetes community put in to, to managing this. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of sacrifice, a lot of mental energy we have to put in. Um, and I think we deserve credit. You know, the kids especially and their parents deserve a tremendous amount of credit for the amount of work they have to put in. You know, we don't use these CGM systems and finger stick monitors for fun. We do them because it's serious work and it's necessary. But we do it because you know we love our kids and we want to take care of ourselves for the adults. That's what it's about. Yeah. Thank you for the sharing that. Dot. It it sure. because I really wonder how an adult with diabetes feels. And I showed the video of this uh, to Aaron and he just kind of shook his head. He's, you know, he's a teenager, but he he's wise because he's been doing this all his life. So he he gets it. But he's just like, what is he doing? Why is he doing that? And I actually did put the comment under there because he's so well known and it would be an amazing way to raise awareness. I commented and I said, I think you should invite some children with type one diabetes to your show so they can show you how that really works. <laughs> But there was no comment after. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, maybe his sidekick liked it or something, but there there was no follow up. But I, that's really what I would I would love is for that to highlight what it's really used for. And then it also has me thinking about people in uh, countries very near to the GCC and even in the U.S., people don't have access to it. Like you said, it's expensive. They can't afford it. And it, someone said maybe economically this would make it cheaper for people. I'm not really sure if that would happen. Um, but there's a lot of people that just don't have access to it. And, and they're the people that need it. Yeah. If these people want to, uh, without diabetes, want to throw their money away on it and have them donate, you know, buy it and donate it to people who can benefit. That would be amazing. I keep saying I would like to see, you know, the Todd's shoes how you buy a pair of shoes and then Todd's would donate a pair of shoes to someone underprivileged in a country. I would love to see one of the CGM companies out there. If you're listening and you're marketing to people that don't have diabetes to, to use it for sports, let's do the buy one, donate one. I, I would, I would love to see that happen. I think that would be a good business model for somebody. So Anyway, Gary, thank you so much for joining me and we're going to have you back again and we're going to talk about some some other things. But again, as I always say, when you're when you're here, we always learn something and more than just one thing. We learn many things. Um, it's it's always a pleasure. And what I noticed when we were talking is I was mindful of the time because you have another meeting to go to. But you're able to share so much with us so efficiently in such a short time that it's, it's wonderful because it, one, this is a sign, a true sign of an expert who knows what he's talking about. Um, and if you have any questions, um, you can reach out to Gary. We'll put the link for his clinic and his email in the show notes as well. Um, but Gary, if you'd like to let us know how people can reach you, if they have any questions, they can certainly um, reach out. Yeah, I mean, they can, anyone can email me directly. Uh, my email is gary at integrateddiabetes.com. Um, I built my practice to serve the needs of people, mainly with type 1 diabetes, children and adults. I have nine clinicians, all of whom either have type 1 or have kids with type 1. So we're very 
committed and passionate about the work we do. And we, we serve people worldwide. We have clients in more than 40 countries uh, all over the globe. <laughs> We're sometimes challenged a little bit by the time zone issues, but we managed to solve yeah, that in yeah. the time. And, uh, you know, we can help people with whatever their needs are in terms of their diabetes care. We do everything but the prescribing. They have to get their prescriptions locally, but we'll help them fine tune and learn more advanced self-management skills and learn how to apply some of the newer technologies and strategies that are available. Amazing. Amazing. I really appreciate it. Are you are you planning? I mean, I know you've updated how to think like a pancreas, but are you planning to write another book? Because I think... Or are you, maybe you are. And Yeah, well, the third edition of Think Like a Pancreas came out a couple of years ago. And that's, that's I think it's the most popular book in the type 1 diabetes community, just based on volume. It is uh, referred working, to by everyone. And it's it's always the first book that people refer to. My new thing is I'm, I'm working on some materials to help people who use CGM understand how to use it more effectively, you know, how to look at their own data, how to utilize their alerts and trending information and just benefit more from it. So just do more than just wear the thing, but really improve your diabetes management and make life easier by using them. So I wrote one recently was published in Italy um, in Italian by a company called Manorini. That's going to be coming out soon. I'll be doing another one here in the U.S. shortly. Amazing. I'd love to get your book here, but like we we discussed in the past and not many people know this, the reason we don't sell Gary's book is because the shipping costs are so expensive that it will make it too expensive for people. So if you buy it from Gary directly, it will be cheaper. Hmm. We're not here to make it more difficult and more expensive. Yeah, there's electronic copies available. Oh, uh, yeah, and that too, that too, so... Thank yeah, you so much, Gary. Yeah. If you want to order for my practice, I'll send them a signed copy. I think the value of the book goes down the minute I sign Oh, it. come on. No, no, time. no. Are you kidding me? The, no, it's it's the most value. It, I always tell you and I tell everyone it changed my life. It changed how I understood what was happening, even though I had good education. But how much education can you get about diabetes in a week, right? You can't absorb it all. It changed how I could, yeah. I knew what questions to ask the doctor even because you don't know what you don't know when you're, you know, first diagnosed, there's so many questions, but you don't even know which questions to ask or what to look at or what to do. So I highly recommend it if you haven't picked up a copy, no matter what stage you are in your diabetes journey, it's it's gold. Well, thanks. And Pam, I appreciate the opportunity to, spend time with you and, and share some information with your, your followers and listeners. You have um, a lot of them. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. And we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.